Andrew Highway. Hello, everybody. Hi, how is everybody today? All good, thank you. Um, uh, thanks very much for um, having us here today. Um, we've got um, a couple of members of my team here who've actually just joined us very recently. Um, we've got Harry Mangles, as just um, many of you might know um, in the Netherlands. Harry is our production director, has just joined us um, one month ago, I believe it is now. And we have Ingvar Carlsen from Sweden, who's uh, just joined us as operations manager as well. So, um, as you may have seen, we have a couple of our full throttle games here. And um, what we'd like to do is uh, give a presentation, just uh, give you some information about where we came from, um, what we're doing at the moment, our games. Um, and also um, our upcoming games in the future too. And then afterwards, if any of you have any questions, we'd be uh, more than welcome to, um, to take any questions you might have. So I'll uh, start with our presentation and try and explain some things as we go through. So as I said, thank you very much again for having us here. It's a great pleasure for us to be here um, over this weekend. I'd like to show you a little bit about where we've come from and things that have been happening to us.
that guy who was actually enthusiastically dancing around while playing a pinball machine was actually one of the members of the band Redline. Who, uh, has anybody ever heard of the band Redline here before? They, um, if anybody watches um, bike racing at all, the Isle of Man TT races, well, the official uh, music, or soundtrack, if you like, for the TT races is King of the Mountain by Redline. It's an amazing piece, so I'd uh, recommend maybe if you quite like the music from our game to check it out online. Um, you'll see here, this is one of our um, colleagues, um, James Reese. Um, we've been, uh, we're growing quite a bit and very fast at the moment, actually, and I'll talk to you a little bit about that shortly. Um, but James um, was supposed to come to a couple of shows um, with us this summer and was actually supposed to come to Pinball Expo in Chicago. Um, James had actually been on holiday for a couple of weeks and was due to then fly out to Chicago from Nebraska, but ended up getting um, a blood clot, so going into hospital. And um, he was in hospital for about five weeks, and at one stage, uh, he was even asked to uh, write a will. Um, they thought it was that serious, but he's just returned home, and he's uh, joining us um, back at the factory on Monday. So we're very happy to have uh, James back in our team. Thank you very much. Thank you. Funny enough, when we were actually in Pinball Expo in Chicago, um, we, we haven't been having a very good run of having our game shipped out for shows. Um, when this um, particular game uh, went over to one of our customers in the States, the um, shipping company put a forklift straight through the, um, our packaging material and shattered the glass. So here we have uh, Roman, our technical director, who looks like he's just straight out of Ghostbusters, um, vacuuming up with, um, with Janos there all of the glass out of the game. Has anybody here ever had um, pinball glass break in a game before? Yeah, so you know what fun that is. Um, as a company, we're always trying to innovate. And, and again, we can, we can come on to aspects of that later. Um, something we decided to do a couple of weeks ago, somebody mentioned to us, well, you know, we love your screen in the back box. We started off with just the screen in the play field there. And the, the whole reason for having that there was that we felt that the, the focus of the player is around the flipper area there. So, you know, you're missing out on all these opportunities on pinball machines normally. They're going, all these animations that are going on the back box, you miss out on them because you're playing the game. So we felt having the screen in the play field surface where you're able to watch everything peripherally, even though you're actually uh, playing, the, playing the game without looking up, we help, felt was a huge advantage. And that's one of um, the core things that we do in our game, in our systems. Um, so we then decided, after feedback from operators in particular and from some of our customers, that maybe we should have a screen in the back box as well, because some people are so tuned into looking up that maybe it's good to have one there. And for operators, they felt that maybe having something there where people around a bar or pub could actually see what was going on without looking over um, into the cabinet was a good thing as well. So we introduced the 10.1 inch screen uh, into our back box system. But then it was said, to, uh, said um, to us by a few other people, it looks great, why don't you go even bigger than that? And to be honest, there was no reason why we couldn't go any bigger than that. One of the advantages of our system is that people can buy a game and then upgrade with new games all the time. So to incorporate new hardware or new innovation, we can then offer that to our customers and they can choose whether they want it or not. But if they do, then it's something they can spread out over the life of the, the cabinet as they can bring new games into it. So we've introduced a 27-inch screen. Um, has anybody seen our game with the 27-inch screen so far? What are, you, what are your feelings of seeing it so far? Sir? You like it? Fantastic. Uh, we've had amazing feedback from, um, from Pinball Expo from France, where it was at uh, Festiflip last weekend. And so if you have any feedback at all over the course of the event, please come and uh, tell either myself or one of my team. These were four, uh, the four original prototypes um, showing different sort of cabinet and trim variations um, in our factory, at our factory. And um, I always show this photo, but in actual fact, that's not where the company started. So sort of four, four and a half years ago now, as it would be, it's either the company started out in my garage. So um, I still have pictures, and I'm going to have to start, I think, at, at a future presentation, just show a few photos from there, because it's quite funny just seeing, you know, cars and stuff everywhere, and just like a pinball machine in bits with wires everywhere, and that's literally how we started. Um, but then we moved into this factory here, which was a 14,000-square-foot factory, which was a massive jump. Um, actually, no, sorry, there was a step before that. We went from my garage, then into the main house itself, and then to all the different rooms in the houses. And at one stage, there was wiring and play fields in one room, and then there was carcasses of pinball cabinets in another. I mean, it was a, it was a nightmare. So um, Then we moved into the, the 14,000-square-foot facility that you see here. But then... We moved into this, which is a, okay, admittedly it could do with a coat of paint, but it's a 42,000 square foot factory, so we nearly trebled in size. Now, one of the things that um, the philosophy um, I have with the company is that we want to bring um, much, 
uh, sort of as many items of equipment into the factory as possible, which can make our lives easier, which means that we can make parts for our pinball machines or processes much more competitively, so we can keep a great uh, sort of check on quality control every step of the way. So I'm going to show you a few pieces of equipment that we have um, introduced over the last couple of months and ones that we are introducing in the next seven to ten days. What we see here is there are two injection molding machines, which means everything you see from things like flipper bats to um, insert lenses on the playfield surface, we can make any of these small plastic parts, the little bushings that you get on flipper mechanisms, all these parts we can make with these machines. Then we have our CNC machine, which is originally a Japanese CNC machine back in... Uh, 1989, I believe it was. It was top of the range, and it uh, does a great job, and it's commissioned, and uh, we're so slowly introducing it into more and more jobs now. But with this, we can cut um, play fields, we can go and cut plastics, and anything else that we would want to make. Now, this here is, it just shows you the installation of a key part of equipment that we have now. And what this is, is a giant 8x4 flatbed printer, meaning a giant sheet 8 foot by 4 foot you can put onto the vacuum bed, and then this flies backwards and forwards and does what we call a CMYK print, which means that we can actually print our own playfields now, and that is actually what we're doing now. So we're printing our own playfields, we're printing, you see the plastic panels at the sides of the pinball machine, the back box, the back glass, all of that we're doing ourselves now, but also all the promotional materials. I mean, you'll see um, on our stand, we've got a couple of banners there, we're making our own banners, we're making our own signage as well, so we're making more and more things like this in-house now. Here's a playfield, um, obviously a playfield wood cut out. Um, this shows you the printing process. And this is a new piece of equipment. Um, we've got two, actually two of these items coming. And these are giant dual belt sanders, which means that you can um, set the height to about a tenth of a millimeter. And then you can run your wood through with or without inserts and basically have it completely smooth and sanded. Um, so these are two machines on the way at the moment within the next seven to ten days. And then we have this, which um, is, is massive. This thing is like eight meters long and, I believe, five or six meters wide. And this is an automatic spray painting machine. So we'll have our lacquer in this machine here. The playfield will go through. It will have an even coat of lacquer come out the other end. Then it gets sanded, goes through again until we have the, finish, the desired finish. To be the best takes skill, commitment, determination. To be the best, you must be prepared to go full throttle. Here we have some uh, playful shots, of course, from Full Throttle. I've already spoken about this is um, when we introduced our 10.1 inch screen, and so uh, we basically listen to a lot of the community as well. So we really do read sort of pinball uh, forums and people who have suggestions, and if we think they're good, we're, we're not afraid to implement them. This just shows you uh, packaging information we send out to our customers, of how we actually package our machines, and you can see that we can fit um, 24 games into a 20-foot container. That's a mock of it in the bottom right corner there. Now, I'm going to show you a video in a second, um, because we've been getting um, more and more publicity as time goes on, uh, getting onto TV in different parts of the world. I mean, for example, we have um, our Canadian distributors, Nitro Amusements over there, uh, Tommy and Don. Um, who were doing an amazing job over in Canada and um, got onto primetime TV with um, Global TV recently, and, um, which was seen by millions of people, I believe. It was a primetime show uh, where uh, they basically you got the um, presenters to play each other at a game of pinball, and it was great publicity for pinball in general, and in particular our game as well. And um, back on home territory, on home turf, 
We, have, uh, we had ITV come to us recently where I'm sure you've all heard of the BBC, which is the main TV station in the UK. Well, the ITV is the, the main commercial channel and has been for many, many years. And so this was an ITV news crew that came and, um, and did a piece on us on the, on the primetime news. So we're going to show you this piece in a second now. Well, I believe we are in a minute. I think the slide is here, so just bear with me a second, please. Uh, here we've got some more production photos. So hopefully we'll come back to this in a minute. So this was just the initial run of, um, of 22 machines that we did. See lots of uh, parts on the table here. Cabinets as they arrive. Cabinets on the production line before. We, do, um, we have a, a process called vacuum foil wrap panels, which we bolt onto the outside. So everybody's aware, you know, traditionally pinball machines have, are made out of plywood and they're nice and solid. Well, we wanted to make them out of plywood too, but we also wanted to offer options where you could have different um, trims, different finishes. And this allows us to do this. So we have this solid carcass of ply, which means it has the structural integrity. You can screw things in and out just as you would do on a normal pinball machine. And then we bolt on um, different finished panels. And you can actually see that on the games that we have out on the floor. At the moment, we have um, one which is our standard edition game, which is a sort of a matte black finish. And then we have um, a, one of our limited edition finishes, which is a really nice gloss finish. So it's a gloss red uh, finished cabinet with a sort of a black gloss speckled uh, metal trim. Uh, back boxes arriving, uh, glass magazines arriving. This is a, a rack we have for our play fields. We're moving them around to and from in the factory and to our suppliers. Uh, these are sh uh, screen chassis for our 10.1 inch screens and lots of uh, bags of parts and wires coming in. One of the things about our game is that we, um, traditionally on a pinball machine, you'll get about 800 meters of wiring. Um, in our games, there's just over 50 meters of wiring, so we've really massively reduced it down. And anybody who's worked on pinball machines will know that things like snagged wires, dry solder joints, uh, you know, just trying to problem solve with so many wires in there is a bit of a nightmare. So we try to really simplify the process for collectors, for operators alike. Small parts on the production line. This is when we were making games earlier on in the year in time for um, one of the first American shows. So the inside of our cabinet, which has been uh, tidied up significantly since then. The underside of our playfield, again, you, illustrates the, the lack of wiring there. And Roman, our technical director. And packaging the game ready for shipping. And then the team who are building the first 22 games. And loading onto the truck ready for shipping overseas. So it's, um, I'm sure many of you will know as well that we have um, made two years ago now, in fact it was, um, we had a first run on production line. It was a great learning process for us as a company to actually get really deep and head, head first into manufacturing where we were approached to design, build and deliver 251 games for Bacardi, the biggest um, privately owned drinks company in the world. Now as a first customer, that was an amazing coup, one that we couldn't turn down. I mean, Bacardi's own procurement department were quoting nine months to turn this around. and We had only four and a half months. We actually would have had longer, uh, in fairness, because the way the story goes is we were approached in the summer, I believe it was of 2012, um, if we would do an R&D project for them to design a game like this. And we said, yes, we would. There's the budget to go and do it. And they said, oh, we, do, we don't think we're going to do it in the end. And they went with somebody else. But then they came back to us just before Christmas. This is about four months later. said, well, we went with somebody else, and we weren't happy at all with the product that they designed for us. And we've now only got four and a half months to get this to market. Can you guys come and help and do it? And I stupidly or otherwise love a challenge, and so we took it on, and this is the product you, um, you see. And so we uh, designed, built, and delivered it within four and a half months on budget and on time. There were some significant challenges as well. It's funny. I always find it quite ironic that um, we as a company are looking to really push the boundaries and bring innovation and technology into the game. And our first job is to reinvent a 1930s pinball machine. So I thought that was slightly ironic, but it still uh, posed a number of significant challenges to us from a manufacturing point of view. One of the things here, I mean, this looks actually very orange uh, around there. But Bacardi were very specific. It had to be Bacardi red, and it had to light up Bacardi red. So we started off by um, putting LEDs around the, the domes there. 
um, and they kept falling off because you have a painted surface there. You have a special technique called uh, distorted art printing before you vacuum form the play fields because that whole play field is, um, is made out of plastic. So that wouldn't work. So we attached the LEDs on the inside of the cabinet. And that was working better, but what's happening is because what you're doing with heat is you're stretching the plastic to form what you see there. And it was coming orange in places. Where the, where the plastic was thinner, it was going orange, and where it was thicker, it was a deep red. So it took about six or seven attempts before we finally got it right um, because it was so intricate. And also you'll see as well there's lots of circles around there. And the way you do distorted art printing is you start off with a distorted image on a flat piece of plastic, and you have a, a tool to make this play field, which is basically you get a big block of aluminium and you mill it and drill it out. Well, we don't, um, as suppliers do, until you have that process there, but the male form of it, if you like, as this giant polished aluminium block. And it takes weeks to go and make this thing, even sort of doing it full time. And then what you do is you have the sheet of plastic and it's sucked down with a vacuum under heat until it gets to this point here. Now, the secret, and one of the really difficult parts, is to get the artwork like that means that that is after it's been distorted. So at the very beginning, you have to start off with a distorted piece of artwork that when you do suck it and heat it, becomes undistorted than what you see there. And that was nothing short of a nightmare from a prototyping point of view. I think we did seven or eight different prototype play fields over about a month before we finally got it right. I just thought I'd share some of the process, um, processes with you so you get an understanding that some things that might look quite easy to do actually have significant challenges um, sometimes in order to get the right and the required end result. But the long and the short of it was is that um, the global CEO of Bacardi and the marketing director of Bacardi were hugely happy with what they got. They got a, a quality product built to last and the, the marketing campaign, which was actually worth billions globally for Bacardi, was a huge success. And this is one of the promotional tools or the main promotional tool that drove that campaign. So we come to Alien, Alien Pinball. As I'm sure um, many of you heard, have um, heard Alien is our uh, second game. Um, it's based on the first two movies, Alien and Aliens, and um, this was a real sort of dream project for me. I mean, I've been a massive pinball fan and enthusiast for my whole life, and um, you know, I always thought, why did nobody make an alien pinball machine? And of course, well, they kind of did, unofficially, back in, I think it was 1979 or 1980, with the Space Invaders game, with the clear Geiger Xenomorph artwork there, but that was very much an unofficial game, and um, you know, lawsuits, I believe, entailed there. But... Then after that, in 19, I believe it was 1992, uh, there was supposed to be an alien uh, pinball machine which is actually based on Alien 3. And uh, one of our designers, who's actually moving to the UK um, now, 35 years industry legend, Barry Ausler, um, he's, he's with us um, full-time from December onwards, and he's already designed games 3 and 4 for us. Um, he actually had designed Alien 3 up to the point when Bally Williams pulled the plug on it because there were problems in production with Alien 3 and it became Bram Stoker's Dracula. So just a little bit of sort of interesting information. It's funny, I was actually asking uh, Barry, because Barry's with us in the UK at the moment, I was asking him the other day, the Miss Multiball, I said, you know, you've got the ball going across the play field. I said, was that meant to be a face hugger, you know, sort of going across the, the play field? And he couldn't remember, so there we go. Or he just didn't want to tell me, I don't know. So um, what you see here now is pretty much the, uh, the finished layout for Alien at the moment. Uh, you'll see there's a few sort of key areas there. But we'll go into it a bit more. I've got some clo more close-ups there that I can show you in some more detail. That's the sort of sideways-on view of Alien. Now, the thing is, you know, I mean, it started off and um, we worked with Dennis Norman at the start for um, the first initial design stages, and Dennis did a great job for us there. We tested the white wood. Uh, we learned a lot from that. Then we went back to the drawing board. We felt we wanted some different mechanisms in there. We had some, better, some more ideas. And uh, we came up then with the next design, which then became the second white wood here, which is meant to be sort of the finished prototype, if you like, before you then start to, to get to the serious points of, um, you know, really building up the walls and everything else with the game. So you see at the bottom here, there's um, sort of three uh, sort of rectangles streams. The one on the left there is Alien, the one in the middle is the multi-ball stream, and the one on the right then is Aliens. And so the idea is at the start of the game is you select which of the universes you want to play in. So it's like a first-person game. You are experiencing uh, the different stories from both of these films. So you select Alien, for example. You have four modes to compete in, for the film, and then once you've completed those, you get to the wizard mode at the end. Once you've completed that, then you go on to the other film. And so these are some of the new toys 
you'll see um, at the top there. Right in the middle, this is the, well, in fact, if you start on the right there, we have um, the pop bumpers there. And we actually have pop bumper caps, which are made out of a sort of a clear resin, and they're based on the eggs. So the, uh, you know, the eggs from Alien. And so we can actually change colours whatever we want because we have our RGB lights on top of the, the pop bumpers there. So we can have lots of sort of eerie effects with, you know, sort of their, their pulsing green or maybe they're on fire so they're burning sort of red and yellow. So we can do all of these effects with our game. In the middle there we have the, um, the Xenomorph toy, which is Xenomorph head. And you'll see underneath there's a circle there, which is a magnet, of course. So the magnet stops the ball, and the, mechanism, the way the mechanism is supposed to work is that a tongue, the xenomorph head opens, the tongue lashes forward and basically grabs the ball, as if it's eating the ball. And then we have the queen on the left there. Um, there's a bit more to the queen than what you can see there. There's a saucer in front of the queen, but behind the saucer, and before the, um, the queen, you actually have, there's a screen there, a playful screen, which would be four and a half to five inches, and we were actually, funny enough, testing the screen only last week. And the screen faces the player and then shows different modes. And then when um, a mode is activated by getting the ball in the saucer. But at various stages in the game, this, this is actually a rotating platform. And the platform rotates to reveal the queen. So would, uh, and we, re we, we revealed this exclusively over at Expo because people wanted to see the queen. Would you like to see the queen as well? Yeah. There we go. So... Fortunately, we can't show you the real queen quite yet. But, um, yeah, so just to follow on a little bit from Alien at the moment, this is, the, uh, this is us just wiring up the, uh, the Whitewood prototype, the most recent one that we um, completed just before Expo. Uh, you'll notice there's no lighting on there at the moment. This is the, uh, the top side of the play field. You can see some of the shots there. Clearly, obviously, none of the ramps are in place, but all the metal board guides are there. And really, the purpose of this now, before you really start seriously building in the mechanisms, which are well in development at the moment, before you actually bolt them onto the playfield, is to make sure that the, the, the game has the flow that it should have. And once you're happy with that, then you can concentrate then on the mechanism placement and how they work. Now, we have a video we're going to show you of the initial uh, Whitewood test, as in the second Whitewood test, the one that we did just before Expo. Here's some more pictures of the Whitewood playfield for you before we get to the video. And here we have the video. And what we have now is what we did uh, reveal at Expo, is we showed um, some of the artwork. Now, one thing I will stress is on the projector screen, it doesn't actually, it, it doesn't show up well at all on a projector screen. So if anybody wants to actually see what the high resolution images look like, then, you know, come and see me at the stand or have a look on Pinside and you can see um, the various high resolution photos. It doesn't show up that well, but it does give you an indication here. You see, you know, we, big utilization of the um, sort of the bone structures and skulls around the outside, the, uh, the eggs there in the forefront. And of course, it's very easily recognizable as being alien. And then we have the side art.
So that um, really sort of concludes my sort of presentation. Um, Best test. Thank you, Andrew. Quiet. Come a bit. Yes. <laughs> that's, that's a bit polite. Come in the middle, Andrew. That's a great story. That's a great story. Thank you very much. Thank hey, you. Um, you. You said you're a pinball enthusiastic for your whole life. Yes. What was your first machine you played? Uh, it was actually, bizarrely enough, it was Space Invaders. Space Invaders? Yeah, it was, it was funny. I was about, I think I must have been about Five, eight years old. Eight years, so, yes. yeah, I'm 44 now, so okay. I'd have been about eight, nine years old. And it was at a local youth club near where my grandparents uh, lived. Back in Welsh? Uh, no, actually, no, it was in Lake District, okay. which is sort of um, just below Scotland in the UK. Yes. And there was a youth club there. And so they had like a Phoenix video game and they had a Space Invaders pinball machine. So I sort of played them in sort of equal, equal amounts. Okay, and 40 years later, you're a manufacturer. You're making pinball machines. Yes. It's a, is it hard for you? You're working now for three, four years? Uh, it's a long process. Yes. Yeah, it's a very long process. I mean, it basically started off, it started off as an idea about eight and a half, nine years ago. Yes. And I did a feasibility study into maybe starting a pinball company. Yeah. But, uh, what kind of a dream was that? What kind of a dream you uh, mean? Was it, it? It was yeah, it was kind of a dream. Oh, sorry, yeah, yes, I, just, I just felt that the, you know, the time was right for a, a new product. Yes. I felt that I'd uh, served my apprenticeship in pinball. I'd done all kinds of things. I'd done bought, sold, repaired pinball machines, operated them. Uh, I had the, you know, so I, I'd spoken to, I knew a lot of operators, and I believed I knew the reasons why pinball had declined at the end of the 90s, and yes. I believed it needed a new product with new technology and innovation, and that's, that was the basis of the idea then, but it wasn't okay. the right timing, so I kind of put it on hold and did other things for about three, four years, and then thought, you know what, maybe wow. now is the right time to do it. And Let's give it a try. There we go, yeah, here okay. I am. <laughs> okay, that's really good. Hey, and are you um, uh, working especially for the, uh, the private market, or also the operators? Uh, well, the thing is, in my mind, pinball started off as coin operated you know yes, every course. pinball machine we've got in our in our homes is a coin operated piece of equipment yes. so for me you know the target is to get games back, back on location again okay. so you know i mean my goal the company's goal is to make pay, pinball main make pinball mainstream again That's so this really is why we're so, happy with that well we started you know we the only reason it took us so long to get to where we are now is that we took pinball and redesigned every aspect of it and said, well, is this good? Is that good? What can be changed to make this easier for operators, easier to service, easier to upgrade, more cost efficient? So we analyzed every aspect of the pinball machine, redesigned it, redeveloped it to yes. get to okay. the product that we have now. But I think uh, Great Britain is quite a hard market. If you look to uh, America, if you look to France, also especially to Holland in Amsterdam, I'm from Amsterdam, mm -hmm. and the pinball machines are coming back a bit, a bit. But I think when I'm, I'm in London, it's hard, it's hard to find a pinball. I don't know, I, mean, I was never in Wales, but it, it's not Great Britain a hard market for pinball. It, it is a hard market, and to be honest, you know, it's definitely nowhere near one of our biggest markets. You know, our biggest market is the USA. It's the uh, USA, okay. It is the USA. USA is good, very good for us, Canada's very good uh, for there us. Are some guys from Canada? Absolutely, yeah, Tommy uh, and Don over there from Nitro. Traveled a long time, okay. So, but, yeah, but the way I see Europe is I see Europe as being a sort of a dormant market. You know, when you go back to the 90s, 50% of all machine sales were coming over to Europe, okay. and Germany was leading the way. Germany, France, yeah. Sweden, I think. Well, everybody looked at Germany to see yes. what they were doing and then came on board, and, and Pimble obviously was massive as a result of that now. So yes. I think it takes a couple of markets to really get going, and then I think the rest will follow in but Europe. But are you also uh, going to try uh, to get the German market? Absolutely, yeah. And it's a, do, you, do you have a distributor there or something? We do. We have a, a distributor for Austrian Germany. Okay, that's really important. Which is, uh, which is Stefan over at RS. Okay. RS yeah, Pinball. That's very good. That's very good. I don't yeah, know. How, good, how's your German? Is uh, German? Ambition. Good? <laughs> okay, it's very good, good. Are there already questions, ladies? Uh, there's one lady, lady and gentleman. This man, yes? Yeah, I have a question about the license. Mm -hmm. Yes, about license. How hard was it to get it and uh, was it expensive? Uh, first, was it hard to get the license? Not really, no. I mean, you know, it all comes down to money. It comes down to money and yes. it comes down to the confidence of the licensor in the licensee to be able to deliver a quality product. You know, I mean, obviously, if you're licensing something like a teddy bear or a doll or, or you know, a poster or something like or a T-shirt, then it's a much more simple process. But when you're doing but something a like a pinball machine, machine, it's massive. There's so much that goes into it. It's complicated. Yes. And um, it's a bit of a minefield, really, because, you know, you as, a, as somebody who's making a game want all these assets and so on, and maybe the licensor says, oh, you can have this or you can have that, but you can't have that, mm -hmm. and you have to try to work around it. So it's a constant batting Talking, to and fro, communication. communication, negotiation, in order to get the assets that you want. Yes, but are you happy now? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, we, we have at the moment, we have um, three licenses all signed up. Alien is the first of those licenses, which is game number two. And then games three and four are already at the Whitewood stage, uh, which, ready to be built as a Whitewood. And which games? 
Well, uh, I can't really say. I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> I wish I could. I wish I could. Sharp. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Okay, but you, have, you got the next and the next. So uh, machine yeah. three and machine four. Absolutely. We're already looking now for for games five and six. Cause, it's incredible. Yeah, for 2017. So 2016 is going to be a very busy year for us. It's incredible. I mean, with how many people are you working? Because I well, saw some. 10, 15 mm -hmm. people? Well, we've, um, we've got now um, 18 people in our factory now. We've just increased that. And we're working with, I believe, it's six or seven people now overseas in different countries as well. So on the team altogether, you're looking 25. at about 25, 26 people. But we're going to be increasing that significantly now over the next couple of months because uh, so far up till now, yes. we've made 22 machines. Yes. But our next goal, and what we're bringing lots of parts in for now and building up to it, is to make 78 games before Christmas. And then the next stage after that is to make 75 to 100 games a month by the end of January. Okay. So it's a significant step up from being a company that has made 22 machines yes. to a mass producer of pinball machines. And that kind of leads us into where we're expecting Alien to be by the time that comes to the market. So building up, so then when we start on Alien, then we really can be in sort of that and mass production phase. When are you going to produce Aliens? Well, we believe Alien. at the moment, realistically, we're hoping April? we can show something... We're hoping we can show something around January. January? That's what we're, we're pushing towards. Uh, at the moment, we have it scheduled on our production line for March. Okay. March 2016. That's really it. That's really, mm. that's really cool. Are there more questions, ladies, gentlemen? Yes. You have a great product. This, uh, you have a great product, <laughs> but we don't know it. I was knowing it, of course. But well, I mean, but it's, it's, it's an interesting, thing, it's yes. a fair point. I mean, you know, I see certain channels, like, you know, we're always updating our Facebook channel, our YouTube, we're bringing lots of videos there. Pinball uh, News. Uh, Pinball News, yeah, yes, we get some great coverage there, there too. Um, yes. But the thing is, you know, we've done a sort of a real whistle-stop tour. I mean, it's been an absolutely crazy six months getting our game out to as many places as possible. I mean, I've been to the States um, with my team now three times, and we've got our fourth time next week, or the week after next, going to Florida. Uh, we've been to, to another I think, show. Yeah, to another, another yes. show. We've done, I think, six shows in Europe. We've done three shows in the UK. So it's been crazy also, for the last six months. Sometimes you also have to sleep, eh? Uh, sometimes. That's, that's yeah, really sometimes. important. But, it's, funny, but it's funny, actually, you mentioned that because yeah. we were delayed yesterday leaving the factory, yes. uh, myself and my guys. Yes. And, uh, and we were actually, after we managed to get on the early crossing over at three o'clock in yeah. the morning with no sleep. And then we got an hour and a half sleep in the van, the three of us, actually, uh, last night. So that's we weren't looking the best when we arrived this morning. That's quite so. nice. That's all <laughs> but that's really good. Uh, I'm sorry? It's well, absolutely, yeah. I mean, there's huge anticipation in the market for Alien. I mean, you know, we, we, um, our sales, sales or pre-orders are very strong on Alien. You know, we get lots of interest all the time on that. And you know, a lot of people think that that's going to be the game that sort of and really launches us. interest from uh, private people or from operators? Uh, both. 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 Okay, really interesting. I mean, the thing is about Alien, the interesting thing is, is that, you know, we all know that it's a coin-op activity. It's not really on location anymore, pinball. But one of the reasons that I thought Alien could be so good to, to, get, to become mass market again is that you look at the Raw Thrills games that are in circulation at the moment, you know, the, um, the, the Alien shooters yes. that are in arcades all around the world. And so you ha you've got not such a hard argument with operators. Well, look, you know, your Alien shooter's doing great money. Yeah, you need so the Alien pinball now. So I think we're just going to really come into play when we get out to the market. Okay, nice, nice. Um, are more questions? Yes, this man. Um, alien. Well, the initial uh, Barry Alsa, by the way, interesting enough, um, back in the day was uh, known as the sort of the quickest gun or the quickest draw in pinball, uh, as in the designer that could deliver the quickest on any game. So if there was any problem solving or you know, the designer had to drop out for this reason or that reason or you needed something done, people went to Barry. So yeah, I've always been a huge fan of Barry, so it's a great privilege to have him uh, you know, coming yeah, to us yeah. full time mm -hmm. to design. Um, and as far as, uh, sorry, what was the other question again? Yeah, the, the designer of Alien. Oh, yeah, the designer of Alien. Well, it started off as Den Nor Dennis Norman, who did the original uh, design concept. Um, and then Dave Sanders, who's our sort of chief designer, who designed Full Throttle, he took over the design of Alien he's after that. He's from England, from US? Uh, Northern Ireland, actually. From Northern Ireland. Northern Ireland, yeah. Really so nice. he's still UK. Yes. He's still no, UK. So yeah, a bit, British. Uh, I'm yeah. Irish. <laughs> <laughs> oh, are you? Yes, <laughs> take care. 
How's Barry's health? He's much yeah. better now, thanks. Yeah, he he's really sick, eh? He was, yeah. I mean, that, it's, that's a very sad, sort of sad story, really. And Half a year ago. Yeah, I mean, both Barry and his wife Donna, you know, both had cancer and both had treatment. Um, and, and Donna, his wife, unfortunately, you know, uh, very sadly passed away only oh. months ago. Uh, and Barry just, and that's one of the reasons why Barry's making a move is that, you know, he's really enjoyed the process of getting back into pinball with us again. But, you know, his hunger is there. You know, he had 35 years of experience designing pinball machines. And he's now heavily involved and he wants to, you know, live, eat, breathe, sleep. You know, pinball Enjoy. again. And so, you yeah, know, we spoke about it and I wanted him there and he wanted to come here. So we're making all the arrangements. And actually, only yesterday, Barry only just, just found a house as well. So he just found a house in South Wales in the earth of Tidville. Yeah, That's so incredible. he's... Uh, That's yeah. really so the, the, the criteria is it's got to be nice for him and his cat. So. <laughs> That's really yeah. good. More questions? Yes, this man. Ah, that's, that's a very good question. Would you like to adapt? Uh, yes? Uh, yeah, good question. It's, yeah, yeah. It's something that, that play, play, definitely plays on my mind and something that I think about a lot and we also discuss internally a lot as well. I mean, the thing is, you know, there's... Britain has a rich history in a number of different areas, and I think without, I can't really go too much into detail about it because, you know, we are um, actively interested in uh, one or a number of licenses. I can't really be any more specific than that, which have a sort of a British theme, but it, it, um, it would be crazy not to do something like that as we are British. But saying that, you know, in the same way that I like the idea of bringing something Britishness to, to pinball, I'm still um, you know, a real purist when it comes to pinball too, and I know that it is Americana, it's an American product, and so we're, we're strong believers in the history of, of where pinball has come from too. Yeah, uh, well, Tommy, for example, as well, yeah. yeah. Hey, there, there are a lot of companies now. You have Stern Pimble, you have mm -hmm. Jack, you have Dutch. How do you see, you are, are they competitors, are they friends? How do you see them? <laughs> friends would probably be pushing it a little <laughs> bit. Um, yeah. Kind of friends. Yeah, I mean, the thing is, you know, we, we came to the market to bring a different product to the market there. We have a system that competitors don't have. So, you know, we, we've done it in a certain way there. We felt that costs were escalating out of control. Yes. And, and one of the ways to make pinball sort of mainstream again is to make it more cost effective, not have it more going more expensive, yeah. as well as all, so all the other issues. Yeah, yeah cheaper. What so do we, I want to buy a pinball. What do, I pay, uh, what do I have to pay for you? Well, I mean, for example, it's uh, $6,050. Okay. which is cash? not a huge amount of cash. Yeah, okay. Cash maybe a little bit okay. less. Okay. <laughs> <That's really good. laughs> but you know, the idea is, is that when you buy the game upgrade kit, which only takes, uh, I don't know if any of you, did anybody see the, the YouTube video that we posted about how quick it is to change our game? Oh, that's interesting. Can anybody actually remember yes. how long it did take in the end? Yeah, three and a half minutes. That's, that was it. And that wasn't even rehearsed. That was just one guy doing it by himself from a, an on state to turning it off, changing everything, putting the new game in, switching on and booting, and that three was three and a half, half minutes. It's actually three minutes, 20 seconds on the clock. That's incredible. Yeah. And that's also inter uh, interested for, uh, for operators, or not? Well, that's right, yes, because it means, you know, I mean, as you I said, I was an operator before, and I had for, to... For how long was your... Uh, uh, best part, about two and a half years. With pinball machines With pinball also? machines. No, just pinball machines. Only I, pinball. Yeah, only pinball and machines. Was it a good market for you? Um, it was, yeah, yeah, it was in good. Wales. I mean, I felt that if you, when you had a good quality game that was reliable and yeah. serviced well and played well, then it took the money. Yes. So, um, uh, give an example. Um, Getaway worked Get very well for me. No Fear worked very well for me. Jackbot worked very well for me. I was kind of really sort of targeting sort of, you know, mid-90s Williams okay. at the time. Okay, but you put a machine mm -hmm. and then we can change it in three minutes. Three minutes, 20 seconds, yeah. And the great thing is as well is that you, when you buy the game upgrade kit, yes. it's like about 60% of the price of a full pinball machine. So you save on the costings there. But the other thing as well is, of course, you don't actually need a big large van to go and take it to the destination. That's incredible. You have it in a small box. Well, I say small, you know, so it's sort of that sort of size kind of, of a, a play field. You just take it in on your sack trolley. Uh, like a suitcase, yeah, yes. with wheels. That's exactly. Really good. That's yeah. an idea. There we go, yeah. Okay. Cabin buggy, uh, cabin baggage. Cabin, there we go. Okay. <laughs> okay. But that was also the idea with uh, Pinball 2000, eh? Yes. A kind of. I mean, I, I see Pinball 2000 more as a sort of a game upgrade kit rather okay. than a game change kit. Yes, you could do that, but yes. if you change the game from you know, episode one to Revenge from Mars, you had to re-decal the cabinet, yeah. for example. And it wasn't so easy, you had to go and take all the not, ROMs off and everything. Not three minutes and, and 20 seconds. Not three eh? minutes and 20 seconds. All right. Yeah. Hey, you're a big fan. Yeah, yeah. That's really good. <laughs> Yeah. 
Mm-hmm. Okay. Muse. That's a Muse. Muse. That's a band. Yeah. Are they from England or Australia? Australia, I think. Muse mm. from Australia. England? I don't know. England. I saw them one. <laughs> yeah. It's modern. It's not Metallica. It's What's your age? I'm 34. Okay. Okay. Okay, but it's I think there might be a new market for this like that. Hmm. What that guy is saying, Jasper? Uh, you won one time the championship, is that true? 2012. Re okay, really <laughs> good. But but uh, like Stern Pimbo's doing mm -hmm. all the Kiss, 40 years old, ACDC, Metallica, Rolling Stones, mm -hmm. 80 years old, and mm -hmm. and he says do Muse. Well, what I, what I can say to you is, is that um, yeah, we're not going to do sort of you know end, endless runs of motorcycle themed games, for example. What we want to do is we want to uh, to have games for different target audiences, yes. which means that. So what I can tell you Science is, is that, yeah. So the, so the four the, our four first games are all very different from each other. Okay, your third and game. Cover, third game and is cover. kind of a Playboy <laughs> uh, girls. Well, who knows? I mean, we, you know, we, have, uh, we have some exciting titles there. Well, that's I'm, what really I say. I'm, I'm excited by the titles. I'm really so curious. I hope, I hope the audience is as well. But you know, we're not a, a huge, sort of huge fan of the, the pre-order model. And I know that, yes, we did do that with Alien because we felt there were so many uh, other games out there that there was a lot of choice there. And we knew roughly when that game would come out. Mm -hmm. We just wanted the market to have the choice then because we were still away from going into production even of our first game then. But as a general rule, um, you know, we want, the way we want to do it is to announce games as we're ready to start making them. Really good. Good. Thank you, Jasper. And win uh, this tournament again. Yes? I speak to you tomorrow. Other questions? Yes, Martijn. I know some people. It's not just like a classroom. Yes, Martijn. Mm -hmm. Are you going to focus on license or on unlicense? Well, essentially, yes. It was funny because I was watching the um, the last half, I guess, of um, of Roger's uh, right. seminar and talking about license, unlicensed yes. games. Uh, and this is something I have to address all the time. And um, you know, it's true that um, yeah, a lot of people want to have unlicensed games, but when it comes da down to it, I think it's much harder to sell an unlicensed game in the current marketplace than it is as a licensed game. Because I think, I mean, that happens for collectors, but also for operators too. I, don't, I think it's, uh, it's a shame, really, because when you look back at the 90s and you see such great titles as Fish Tales and Getaway and you know, all those titles that we loved back in the 90s, I think you know, Pimble was on such a roll at the time, had such momentum, that you know, Bally Williams could have really released anything and it still would have had a, a commercial success to it. So, but I think the marketplace is different now. I think the general requirement from both sectors is for licensed games. Now, that's not to say that we won't do an unlicensed game in the future. But I mean... Yeah, I mean, Cersei's Animal House, the one that was, that was what was full throttle, uh, you know, people still ask all the time, are you still going to do it? Are you still going to do it? And you know, if, it was my, if it was Dave Sanders' choice, our game designer, you know, he'd, be building, he'd be designing again now as an extra release. Uh, so yeah, we may well address it, but you know, there's, there's a few surprises we, ha we have in store over the next year or two which will address that as well. Very good. I just think that, you know, when, when you've got an unlicensed theme there, yes, you have a blank canvas, yeah. but then, you know, you have to try to think, well, will the market like this or will the market not like this? It's a very subjective thing when you're dealing with something that, that's not in existence. Whereas if you look at something like Alien, which has such rich materials, such a massive fan base there, and as long as you come in and have the right people there, they're going to do, you know, a, such a design justice. And, and that's what I insist from our team. And, you know, we've got other people who are massive Alien fans on our team as well. And we're all share, we all share the same belief that we've got this golden opportunity to deal with one of the biggest licenses of all time and to do it justice. And, and I insist, as, a, as the head of the company, that we do that. When are you happy with Aliens? How many uh, machines do you want to sell? A thousand? Uh, I, I would say... Two thousand? Yeah. I mean, Two thousand? thousand or more, I think, would be a successful yeah. run. But who knows where it would go, so... Twenty thousand? Uh, well... <laughs> I hope so. Other questions? Gentlemen? This lady, maybe? You have a question? There's a question. Yes, mister. Um, 
You mean for each game, for in individually? Is it full throttle? Hardware, software? What's more investment? Uh, do you know one that is, it's actually quite difficult to answer from the full throttle point of view because we've been developing it for so long, whereas the other titles we've been developing for a much shorter period of time. So, <coughs> excuse me, I think that with full throttle, we we almost went through a few changes, really, we probably didn't need to change. Like, at one stage, we changed the ramps, and, and then it went from a, a working ramp system to a non-working ramp system. It's like, you know, guys, why, why are we doing this to take something that's working and make it not working? So I think you can over-design something, if you like. You know, if, when you have something and it works, you should sort of stick yes. to it. And this is some of the design principles that we learned early on. But, you know, what I can say is, is the way that we design our games now, we can actually, once we're up to speed and we, you know, all the hardware is, is nailed down and everything, it can actually be a very quick process to design a game. And one of the ways, I'm um, sure maybe um, some of you have read about, the way we develop our games is that we have it working on a virtual platform first. So we have the white, once the white wood, we know what rough direction we're going in, we then build it up on a future pinball platform, and then we can test it, and then we can test lighting, test rules, this, that, and the other, without having to go through more expensive processes with an actual, uh, in an actual game or an actual prototype. I mean, you still can't cut out the white wood process because no matter how a virtual game plays, it's not how a, a real game will play in the real world. So, but once you've nailed that, and you know the game is playing well, and it's got the flow, and the shots are working, then you can concentrate on the other aspects. And by doing it on a digital platform. It means you can speed up that process uh, much quicker. I mean, it was amazing really how quickly games three and four came to the forefront. You know, we were you know, designing uh, the Alien Whitewood and then uh, you know, Barry comes, uh, you know, basically almost like coming to his office, there you go, let's go and build it. And, it's, uh, and then, you know, comes a couple of weeks later, here's number four, there you go. You know, it's when like, you uh, slow down, Barry. You when know, are you going uh, to give us the titles? <laughs> when? <laughs> well, I mean, be during the course of next year, of course. Of course, yeah. we will invite yeah, you. Absolutely. Other questions? Gentlemen, yes, yeah, gentlemen, yes. Mm -hmm. Wow. Is that the gossip or is it true? I'm sorry? Is it the gossip or is that true? No, 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 it is true. Is I mean, we were approached to do this. I mean, it has slowed down a little bit recently because, uh, you know, when you have a group of enthusiasts who want to go and, you know, develop on a platform, um, you know, when it gets momentum going, things happen very quickly. Um, it hasn't... Work, it hasn't um, moved forward as quickly, I think, as all parties would have wanted. Possibly partly our fault because we've been so you know, knee deep in full throttle development in our game system and getting the game out to the market that possibly we haven't been you know, able to give it as much attention as we would have wanted to. But you know, we're not, certainly not against the idea, and it's something that you know, we're certainly looking to do in the future and working with keen people. Um, and yeah, we've been approached by a number of people who've either got ideas for games or have actually built up some games and just want to take it to the next level and take it out commercially. And, uh, you know, in some That's serious discussions. Eh? I'm sorry? That's also interesting. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, it's very so interesting. There's a lot of talent out there, and that's one of the great things. There's a lot of talent things. in the world, yeah. of course. Yeah. If you have a pinball machine, maybe, in your backyard, call yeah. Andrew. Yeah, well, <laughs> we never, never know. know. Okay. Yeah. Yes, ladies, gentlemen. Hey, Andrew, it was really good to have you and your team here. Yeah, thank you very maybe, much for having us. Thank maybe you. Maybe we can invite you already for next year. Thank you. Shall I we do that, to, boss? Shall we already? I like all, I always <laughs> saying things and then people say, hey, you next <laughs> but we invite you now yeah. for next year and you give us title three, title four, title yeah. six. Yeah, 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 yeah. You may well know them by then. So. Okay, yeah. really. Hey, may I have a warm applause for... Uh, yeah. thank, you. thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Cheers. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Boss, what are we doing? Yeah, and there are there's some sign. There is a senior chassis. Yeah. Uh, Hopefully, they're still there. Uh, Roger Sharp and Greg Forrest having a signing session on this side of the the big room. Good job. Hey, Jim. <laughs>